Hello everyone, I'm Ray. Welcome to M2 Story. On December 8, 2023, a judge in the province of British Columbia, Canada, announced that the defendant, Ibrahim Ali, who was accused of killing the Chinese-Canadian girl Marisa Shen, has been convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for 25 years. This can be considered a gratifying outcome, given that the marathon-like trial, lasting for six and a half months, has finally ended. However, it is also a long-awaited verdict as the victim's family and those seeking justice had been waiting for six years. If Marisa were alive today, she would have been a young woman approaching her twenties. It can be said that this is a case where justice has been served, but it still lingers as a deeply troubling one for many. Today, we will take a moment to revisit and review the Marisa Shen murder case. During this trial, the court imposed a media publication ban prohibiting the public disclosure of the trial's proceedings and details. However, due to the high level of public interest in the case, there were long queues of people every day seeking to attend as observers. Those who couldn't get in or were located in other areas could listen to the trial via phone through the BC court system to stay updated on the latest developments in the case. However, during the final stages of the trial, including closing arguments and sentencing, the phone lines were often jammed with people waiting for as long as 30 minutes without getting through. Even the M2 reporter was among those patiently waiting on the phone, all in the hope of providing the most complete and comprehensive information to everyone as soon as the publication ban was lifted. The name Marisa Shen is one that has deeply affected all of Canada, especially within the hearts of the Chinese-Canadian community. The perpetrator in the Marisa Shen case was arrested, and the evidence against him was overwhelming five years ago, but it took until now to reach a verdict. And in the interim, there were complications related to the death of a key witness. The situation outside the courtroom was also tense, with the Chinese-Canadian community coming together for street protests. Many individuals from various ethnic backgrounds joined in, directing their anger towards Canada's immigration policies. Many believe that alongside the perpetrator in the dock, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau should also be held accountable because of his push for lenient refugee acceptance policies which they argue contributed to this tragedy. Let's start with a missing person case that occurred in the evening of 2017. On the night of July 18th, just past 11 p.m., in Burnaby, British Columbia, Canada, a mother reported to the police that she had returned home after finishing her day's work, only to discover that her 13-year-old daughter, Marisa, was missing and her phone was turned off. Initially, the police didn't give it much attention, assuming that a child of that age might be out with friends, and it was possible that her phone had run out of battery or she had intentionally turned it off. They believed that she would eventually return home when she got tired or ran out of pocket money. However, the girl's mother was extremely worried, as her daughter always returned home before 8 p.m. At her insistence, the police checked the GPS location of the girl's phone, which indicated the last signal came from Burnaby Central Park about an hour ago. This park was not far from her home and was a popular gathering spot for local teenagers at night, reinforcing their initial assessment. The anxious mother insisted that the police accompany her to the park to search for her daughter. Two officers reluctantly joined her on this late night endeavor. By this time, it was approaching midnight, and the three of them used flashlights to search the area multiple times but found no signs of Marisa. The police advised the mother to return home and wait for updates. Less than an hour later, a routine patrolling officer in the southeast area of the park discovered a pink owl-shaped cartoon wallet and a powered-off cell phone near a footpath. About a meter away, there was a dropped white piece of paper, a student ID card with the name Marisa Shen on it. The officer immediately reported the findings to the police station, and the operator entered the surname Shen into the computer, which promptly brought up the mother's report of her daughter missing a little over two hours earlier. It was only at this point that the disappearance case garnered the full attention of law enforcement. They dispatched more personnel to Central Park and called in search and rescue teams. At 1.10 a.m., the police discovered Marisa's lifeless body not far from where the wallet was found. The forensic examination estimated that she had died approximately three hours earlier, around 10 p.m. on that fateful night. On this hot summer evening, Marisa's life came to a tragic end at the age of 13. The person most heartbroken was, of course, Marisa's mother. Upon discovering her daughter's disappearance, she had made nearly 40 frantic phone calls. At Marisa's funeral in early August, the mother sobbed uncontrollably and gently stroked her daughter lying in the coffin as if trying to wake her up just like she used to do every morning. 
mother and daughter had immigrated to Canada a year prior, and they depended on each other. To provide a better life for Marisa, who was about to enter middle school, her mother worked multiple jobs and often didn't return home until late at night. Marisa was a responsible and obedient child. During the summer break, after attending morning tutoring classes, she would go home to cook for herself. In the afternoons, she would either play on her phone or do arts and crafts. Occasionally, she would go to a nearby coffee shop to use the free Wi-Fi, but she always made sure to return home before it got dark. The police reviewed Marisa's apartment complex and the surveillance cameras near the crime scene in Central Park, focusing on the period between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. Surveillance footage showed that Marisa left her apartment around 6 p.m. and entered a nearby Tim Hortons coffee shop. Inside, she leisurely enjoyed some snacks, drinks, and used her phone, appearing relaxed. After spending approximately an hour and a half there, she left, making sure to clean up her table and politely hold the door for an elderly person who was about to enter. At this point, it was 7.40 p.m. If she intended to be home by 8 p.m., the quickest and shortest route was through Burnaby Central Park. Unfortunately, this path was devoid of surveillance cameras and, according to satellite images, was densely wooded with no streetlights. It was rarely traveled at night. This shortcut became the final stretch of Marisa's brief life. Several hours later, her body was discovered at the red circled spot on the map, which happened to be in the middle of that path. What transpired during the hours between her disappearance and her tragic death was initially not revealed by the police. However, according to a later autopsy report made public, her shorts had been removed, and she had suffered varying degrees of tearing and injuries in her lower body and private parts. The cause of death was mechanical asphyxiation. It is difficult to imagine the torment and despair she endured before her death. Amidst public anger, panic spread rapidly. Young women were afraid to go out alone at night, and parents with daughters began taking time off work to escort their children. Some even stopped sending their daughters to summer tutoring classes. Faced with immense societal pressure, the police struggled to make progress. The secluded nature of the path, the absence of security cameras, and the fact that it was deserted at night presented significant challenges. With no eyewitnesses, the police interviewed over 2,000 people, including nearby residents, but found no valuable leads. Due to the accumulation of stones and fallen leaves at the crime scene, complete footprints couldn't be recovered, and no suspicious hair, fingerprints, or clothing fibers were found. The only evidence connecting the perpetrator was a semen DNA sample found inside the victim's body, yet no matches were found in the criminal DNA database. The police were left with the DNA sample, unable to make progress, while the perpetrator entered a period of inactivity, never committing another crime. Desperate to solve the case, the police collected photographs and video footage from Marisa Shen's funeral and memorial service. From a criminal psychology perspective, they considered the possibility that the killer might attend such events for perverse satisfaction. However, these efforts didn't yield significant results. The police had more than 90 individuals on their list of suspects at various points, but each one was ruled out due to DNA discrepancies. As a year passed without any breakthrough, the residents of Burnaby, especially the Chinese community, began posting numerous flyers on the streets, particularly in the vicinity of Central Park, warning people about an unidentified murderer on the loose. Learning that the city government had not installed surveillance cameras in Central Park, a group of Chinese men and elderly volunteers formed a volunteer patrol team. They would ride bicycles back and forth on the park's paths every day, ensuring the safety of women and children. The helpless police ultimately placed their hopes on an emerging technology still in the experimental phase, known as genetic profiling. In simple terms, human characteristics such as hair color, height, race, gender, and even facial features are determined by genetics. Scientists can use DNA analysis to create a computer-generated representation of a person's facial features, allowing them to potentially identify the perpetrator. However, human appearance can change due to environmental factors, life experiences, and aging. Both the academic community and public opinion have been skeptical of this technology, citing concerns about its accuracy and the potential for wrongful arrests. Additionally, there are privacy and misuse of law enforcement powers concerns associated with this technology. As a result, genetic profiling technology, despite being researched for over a decade, remained outside the mainstream of forensic investigation and was not widely accepted.
It wasn't until 2018 that this technology experienced an unexpected breakthrough. Another famous case, the Golden State Killer, was apprehended after evading capture for 44 years. After comparing the genetic profile to the actual person, it was discovered that, aside from some differences like a fuller face and receding hairline, the two were remarkably similar, particularly in terms of the size, shape, and proportion of facial features, and even the laugh lines on both sides of the face. The resemblance was estimated to be at least 80%. Subsequently, a similar comparison was made for another fugitive murderer, William Talbot, who was captured around the same time as the Golden State Killer and had been on the run since the 1980s. It was found that, aside from the weight gain and receding hairline, the facial features and skin tone predicted by genetic profiling closely matched his actual appearance. These two examples provided substantial evidence that this technology could be reliable. This rekindled hope for the Burnaby Police Department, responsible for investigating the Marisa Shen case. Since less than a year had passed, since the DNA sample extraction from the perpetrator in the Marisa Shen case and the suspect's physical characteristics were not expected to have significantly changed, the accuracy of genetic profiling technology was expected to be greatly enhanced. Based on the genetic profile, the perpetrator who killed Marisa was estimated to be between 25 to 35 years old, with dark hair and eyebrows, light brown skin, a slender oval face, a long nose, and a chin that may have a feature commonly referred to as a butt chin. DNA analysis also indicated with high certainty that this individual originated from the Middle East, specifically the northern regions of the Middle East, including Syria, Lebanon, northern Turkey, and a small area of Iraq. This significantly narrowed down the pool of potential suspects. To avoid potential issues related to racial discrimination, the police did not publicly release the genetic profile of the suspect. Instead, they shared it on a limited basis with certain Middle Eastern communities and organizations in the local area. This approach aimed to collect leads while encouraging young men in these communities who resembled the suspect to voluntarily provide DNA samples, assisting in both solving the case and clearing their names. The police themselves understood that the perpetrator certainly wouldn't voluntarily provide a DNA sample. However, when they cast this wide net, they hoped to get lucky by finding one or two of his close relatives. And indeed, luck was on their side. In late August 2018, the laboratory responsible for testing delivered some promising news. Among the more than 300 voluntarily provided samples, there was indeed a relative match, although it wasn't a direct relative. It was a close relative within three generations. Upon hearing this news, the police were both excited and somewhat disappointed. They knew that Middle Eastern families are known for their size, often having over 20 cousins and around 40 second cousins. Going through them one by one could take an eternity. However, soon another piece of news arrived that reinvigorated the police. The investigation revealed that within the family of the person who provided the matching sample, only one male member met all the criteria from the genetic profile. It turned out that this family had arrived in Canada as refugees from Syria just over a year ago. Their family was relatively small, which saved the police a significant amount of time and resources. The suspect's name was Ibrahim Ali, a 28-year-old single man who worked as an exterior wall decorator at a construction company. He had no prior criminal record, and his apartment, which he rented a year ago, was less than 700 meters away from the Central Park, where Marisa was murdered. The police didn't have much trouble collecting his DNA sample from the discarded items in his life. After analysis, it was a perfect match with the DNA found inside Marisa. With such solid evidence in hand, the police wasted no time in apprehending him from his workplace and charged him with first-degree murder. After one year and two months, the real perpetrator was finally caught. However, what people didn't anticipate was that a legal nightmare that would last for five years was just beginning. First of all, Despite mainstream media downplaying the suspect's refugee background, it stirred a significant public outcry. The main reason for this was that some citizens had questioned the Canadian government's practice of accepting 25,000 Syrian refugees, fearing it would not only pose a financial burden, but also create security risks. At the time, Prime Minister Trudeau had assured the public that Canadian safety would be guaranteed. To substantiate his claim, the Trudeau government had publicly disclosed the conditions for refugee sponsorship. They emphasized prioritizing families, particularly women and children, while allowing men to remain in Syria to protect their homeland. However, Ali was only 28 years old and unmarried, raising questions about how he could came to Canada. 
media outlets continued to dig deeper. It turned out that Ali had come to Canada through a program called Private Sponsorship, which was significantly different from government-sponsored refugee intake. Specifically, as long as a private group or individual pledged to cover all expenses, including accommodation, settlement, health care, and basic living needs, the sponsored party could also utilize the expedited refugee approval process. They did not need to meet requirements related to gender, age, or family background. However, although it seemed that money could get things done, the difficulty level was high. For a typical family of four, sponsorship costs ranged from $80,000 to $100,000 per year, depending on the city where they settled in Canada. In some cases, the costs could be even higher, depending on local housing prices. This sponsorship period was for a minimum of one year and could extend up to three years. According to information from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, CBC, the St. Andrew's Wesley United Church in Vancouver, along with a community group from Bowen Island, collectively sponsored Ali's relatives, a family of six from Syria. In a short amount of time, they raised $650,000 in donations, found a house for them on the island, furnished it, rented a car, registered the children in schools and daycare, and even took care of details like airport pickups. As donations poured in enthusiastically, they found themselves with an excess of $50,000. That's when Ali's relatives had an idea. Since they had an eligible bachelor brother, Ali, they decided to use the surplus funds to sponsor him as well. On March 2, 2017, this family of seven arrived in Canada, greeted not only by relatives, but also by representatives from the church and island residents. A photo of them posing at Vancouver Airport was published in the local newspaper the following day, featuring a typical, touching Canadian story. Afterward, Ali did not follow in his brother's family's footsteps by settling down on the island. Instead, he used the donated funds to enroll in an English language course in the bustling city of Burnaby and rented a small apartment. With housing, education, and financial support readily available, everything came too easily for Ali. It was just four months later that he would commit a heinous act against the unsuspecting girl, Marisa Shen. What's even more infuriating is that just three months before Ali was apprehended, he was invited back to Bowen Island to reunite with his brother's family, celebrating his one-year anniversary in Canada. This event also made the newspapers and in the photos he appeared even more relaxed and composed compared to a year earlier. Little did anyone suspect that he had already taken an innocent life. The story of this heartwarming Canadian murderer became widely discussed, and people directed their anger towards Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau. After all, he had assured the public that accepting a large number of refugees would not pose a threat to societal security. Now, how would he respond to the questioning and criticism from various quarters? What did he say during his formal response in an interview with Maclean's magazine? One is asking what you have to say about the, the arrest in British Columbia of Ibrahim Ali, who is a Syrian refugee, following the murder of a teenage girl named Marissa Shen. Uh, obviously, it, it's a, uh, devastating news for, for her family, for her friends. It's a terrible tragedy. Anytime uh, someone is murdered, it's a, it's a terrible thing. Uh, I trust our justice system. I trust uh, our system to, uh, to go through its processes to both uh, apply consequences to this and uh, to make sure that we're, we're thinking about how we continue to keep people safe. One can only say that Prime Minister Trudeau's words were eloquent and impeccable, leaving no room for criticism on the surface. However, it feels like he said everything while saying nothing at all. What drew the most criticism were his facial expressions during this short one-minute speech. He had several moments where he smiled but seemed to restrain himself, creating an awkward impression no matter how you look at it. As a result, multiple media outlets reported headlines like Trudeau's first response to refugee-related murder of a Chinese-Canadian girl, multiple laughter incidents, sparking public outcry once again. However, some argued that throughout the over 60-minute interview, Trudeau consistently wore this half-smile, neither genuinely smiling nor frowning, and his face appeared visibly tilted to one side. They believed it was unrelated to the Marissa Shen case and shouldn't be considered discrimination against the Chinese community. Did Trudeau really laugh? Quickly became a trending topic, and both his supporters and critics engaged in heated debates online. So, how did the reliable legal system that Prime Minister Trudeau mentioned handle this case? Firstly, 
Ali rejected the prosecution's offer of a second-degree murder plea agreement and insisted on pleading not guilty, leading to the dismissal of five lawyers as he sought one who could secure his immediate release. Since Ali couldn't afford a lawyer, all the lawyers assigned to him were legal aid lawyers. While these lawyers are free for Ali, the fees are covered by the government, ultimately funded by taxpayers. The final choice for Ali was Kevin McCullough, a lawyer with 30 years of experience specializing in cases involving sexual assault and murder. According to information provided by McCulloch's law firm, his fees start at $300 per hour. Every time Ali changed lawyers, they had to review the entire case file again, incurring additional fees and often leading to trial delays due to the new lawyer's unfamiliarity with the case. Unlike lawyers who can be hired with money, finding a Kurdish language translator for Ali was challenging. He claimed he couldn't speak English, French, or even Arabic, the official language of Syria. The only language he claimed to know was a relatively obscure dialect of Kurdish, and he could only speak and understand it but couldn't read or write. Certified Kurdish language translators in Canada are scarce, and their fees are also quite high. Because of the language barrier, every time Ali communicated with his lawyer, a translator needed to be present, causing delays whenever the translator wasn't available. For Ali, the time he spent in custody could be counted as 1.5 times towards his eventual sentence, meaning from his arrest in 2018 to the trial's start in 2023, these five years effectively amounted to seven and a half years for him. Due to the lawyers and Ali's constant disruptions, the trial was repeatedly postponed, and it was further delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic. It wasn't until April 2023, nearly six years after Marissa's murder, that the trial officially began. A memorial bench for Marisa Shen was placed in the Central Park, where she was last seen, with an inscription that read, Thoughts are long, love is long, we will hold hands again in the afterlife. Marisa's mother's deep longing for her daughter moved many. However, this long-delayed trial faced numerous twists and turns. Firstly, the trial was delayed due to various reasons. The translator tested positive for COVID-19 and had to self-isolate, and one juror had to leave because of a family member's death. In the meantime, Ali, the defendant, repeatedly acted up. He claimed that during his years in detention, he developed schizophrenia, experiencing hallucinations, severe headaches, and memory and judgment impairments due to medication prescribed by doctors. He frequently used these claims as reasons for requesting postponements of the trial. After five months of ups and downs, the courtroom was suddenly hit with devastating news. Tracy Pickett, a 55-year-old female forensic pathologist who was a key prosecution expert witness in the case, was found dead in a wooded area in Southlands. After conducting an investigation, the police concluded that Dr. Tracy's death was a suicide. They believed that her ongoing battle with depression, coupled with her participation in the Marisa Shen case as a witness, had brought back painful memories, which became unbearable, leading her to take her own life. What's most puzzling is that she continued to testify in the case until the day before her death, helping to uncover the injustice suffered by the victim. As a senior forensic pathologist known for her responsibility and dedication, why did she suddenly abandon everything and, on her way to work, choose to end her life in a remote area? Despite numerous doubts, the police ultimately ruled her death a suicide. Meanwhile, Ali, the defendant, did not miss the opportunity to request the dissolution of the jury and a retrial, citing the death of this crucial witness. However, after careful consideration, the judge decided to proceed with the trial, only removing Tracy's previous testimony from the record. It seemed that with the situation turning increasingly unfavorable, Ali's defense attorney resorted to a desperate and shameless strategy, shifting blame onto the deceased victim, knowing that Marisa Shen could not defend herself. Counsel claimed that Marisa Shen was a troubled teenager whose relationship with her mother had deteriorated and who did not want to return home. He pointed out that Marisa's lack of money in her wallet indicated that she was in financial straits and even implied that she might be earning money by engaging in compensated dating. In addition, he implied that she may have willingly had sex with Ali because he was young and beautiful. The attorney admits that it was immoral for Ali to have sex with a minor in the park, but he argues that Ali didn't kill Marisa. He just left, implying that the real killer was someone else. This audacious defense strategy caused an uproar both inside and outside the courtroom. Not only did hundreds of Chinese individuals spontaneously protest the injustice and insult to the victim that occurred during the trial, but many also criticized the attorney online for lacking professional ethics and trampling on moral boundaries in pursuit of victory. 
Faced with such unethical behavior from their adversary, the prosecution argued that the defense attorney's claims about Marisa Shen's family were cherry-picked and taken out of context. They emphasized that Marisa Shen's mother had made over 40 phone calls after discovering her daughter's disappearance as proof of her concern. Furthermore, her father and brother had come all the way from China to attend the trial, reliving the painful memories of losing Marisa, faithfully attending each day, and supporting one another. As for the allegations of being out at night and prostitution in the park, they dismissed them as nonsense and asserted that if Marissa had not wanted to be home by eight o'clock, she might not have taken a shortcut through the park so that she might not have been fatally attacked by Ali. In the face of strong accusations from the prosecution, the defense made a last-ditch effort. Just moments before the jury was about to announce their verdict, the defense attorney suddenly informed the court that he had received death threats and provided a threatening letter that had been placed in his mailbox. The letter contained ominous messages about his gruesome demise and the suffering of his family. Interestingly, the letter was written in a style resembling the familiar Chinglish we know, leading the attorney to suspect that it might have been sent by supporters of Marisa Shen's family. Subsequently, the attorney requested an immediate suspension of the trial, nullification of the jury's conclusion, and a rescheduled trial, citing external interference with the jury and an impact on the trial's fairness. The judge promptly rejected this unreasonable request, stating that in such a situation, the proper course of action would be to report the threats to law enforcement and let the police conduct an investigation. Consequently, Ali was ultimately convicted by the jury of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole for 25 years. And just as we were about to conclude the narrative of this case, another startling development emerged. The police suddenly announced the suspension of Ali's sentencing and sentencing hearing, citing concerns for courtroom security. They promptly arrested a man who had been present as a spectator, discovering a loaded firearm in his possession. While the police did not disclose his specific identity, they mentioned that he had a close connection to the deceased in this case. However, based on confirmations from other eyewitnesses at the scene, it was revealed that this middle-aged man was Marisa Shen's father. The motive behind his risky act of bringing a firearm into the courtroom remains unclear. Still, it appears highly likely that he may have intended to confront the defendant or the defendant's attorney. Since Canaba does not have the death penalty, Marisa's father seemed determined to deliver his version of justice for his daughter, seeking vengeance. This impulsive action introduced a new twist to the case's final moments. Once again, the defense attorney, citing threats to his own life, requested the nullification of the trial's outcome and a retrial. Simultaneously, an appeal was filed. Do you recall how Prime Minister Trudeau commented on this case? We trust that our legal system will provide a satisfactory outcome for everyone. Personally, I believe there should be an additional statement. If the legal system fails to solve the problem, inevitably, then it is natural for some to resort to other means to ensure that the offender bears the consequences that he deserves. Thanks for watching. See you in our next episode.